Have you ever wanted to take on a big, risky project but had trouble getting buy-in? Yeah. I'm Marco. And I'm Miriam, and we are both product designers at Facebook in London, uh, where we tackle growth and retention problems. And we're going to tell you a story about how we tackled a big, risky project that taught us one of the biggest lessons that we learned together. We're going to talk about what makes risky projects tough and how we've learned to make space for them. Because even if a risky project doesn't work out exactly the way that you hoped it would, the lessons that you will learn from it are how you will make big shifts in your product strategy. So, the Facebook product that we work on is called Workplace. How to explain Workplace? You might be familiar with what a group has looked like on Facebook for many years. Uh, and, you know, what I tell people about Workplace, which is here on this side, is it's sort of like a personal, private Facebook group with just the people you want, but a bunch of tools to get your work done. Uh, there's no ads, so it's pretty different in that sense. It's a great platform to connect your whole organization. We have about just over 2 million paid users on it. As Facebook evolves, we also evolve. And this year, we have announced a bunch of redesigns to both platforms. Uh, the Workplace one is already live. And the new Facebook on the web, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, is coming real soon. But working on Workplace comes with its own set of challenges. It's not a zero to one product. Uh, it started in 2011 as work groups inside Facebook. These were only visible to Facebook employees. And then we created a fork of the consumer product to separate work from social. This means the code base comes with a lot of legacy problems. And we have to be smart about the features that we inherit from consumer Facebook. Performance improvements, we, we want all of those. But the new dating feature, not so much. And being a growth designer on Workplace means we're trying to bring people to the product and help them understand the value. Make sure they see this value so that they can stick around. When I think of the problems that we're solving, um, I like to think of it like planning a really great party. We need to get the word out, uh, get people to be interested in it, hopefully they'll show up, and ultimately, if it's a great party, hopefully they'll bring their friends. So Facebook for work sounds pretty great, but Facebook is this big, complex tool that does a ton of different things, and it does those things well when you're connected to other people. But imagine joining Facebook and being the only person there. In our party scenario, this would be like having somebody show up and be the first person at the party. How do you get them to want to stay at the party when they're the only person there? How do you get them to see the value and want to bring their friends? Because the party is only going to get good when there are other people there. The same thing goes for starting up Workplace for your team. To put this in data terms, the vast majority of people bounce from our product in their first visit. Through research, we realized that the landing experience was really weird for people. It was confusing. They were wondering, what is Workplace? What is it for? It looks kind of like Facebook. It's like this grayish thing. Why is nobody else here? If I post things here, are my colleagues going to see my holiday pictures? What is this thing? And the usual process will be to optimize the product we had. Initially, this is what our extended team wanted. But they wanted to optimize, but our baseline wasn't really good enough. It would be like moving flowers and snacks in our party while there's like a live bear chasing away our guests. Our baseline needed some help. Our party wasn't really working. You couldn't actually demo the product before signing up. You had to show up to the party, put on a blindfold, get told this whole list of all the rules, how everything was going to work, um, agree to them before you could even get to the party. And then once you were in the party, you realized you were the only person there, and you had to figure out what to do with yourself. So when we looked at behavior in the early days of the product, we could see what it was matching when we were listening to this research. The vast majority of people were making it through this complicated five-step sign-up process, only to bounce immediately once they reached our product. To solve this, we felt like we needed to take on a big bet, a risk and an ambiguous project. It wouldn't be enough to change the content or the order of the existing product. We needed a bigger change. 
How big bat normally works for us goes something like this. We come up with a bunch of ideas as a team. We then prioritize which ones to work on by calculating how many people they'd reach and how big the expected impact would be. We work on these ideas early because we know they'll take further iteration to get right. This onboarding project ticked all those boxes. It was early enough in the funnel to reach many people and had expected high impact because we'd be showing people the value in our product, likely causing them to stick around more. Now, both of us have a background working for different design agencies and startups like these ones. Um, we've both tackled lots of different onboarding flows before. Uh, Marco actually worked at uh, Spain's first social network, 20. Um, and I've designed a ton of different onboarding experiences for different products. We looked at this problem and we thought, there's obviously a clear solution here. We'll just find out what people are here to do and then we'll show them how to do that in our product. Basic. We thought it would be great to do something like what you'd get if you're signing up for Apple Music or Spotify. We'd ask you what you're interested in, and then we'd customize your experience based on what you'd selected. And back to our definition of a big bet. This project was a really good example. Delivering a customized onboarding experience felt right for a product that does a huge variety of different things. And figuring out which exact things to show people would be tricky. So it was a big, ambiguous space to work within. And this project wasn't something the rest of the team was bought into. Like I said, they wanted to optimize our existing product and run experiments that were most likely to see metric wins. But we wanted to make more lasting changes. We didn't want to keep bringing people to our product just to see them leave. So we pitched the team on a running an experiment where we show people a set of things they could do in the product and you know, would have them choose which ones they want. We put together what we believed at the time were the top five reasons people wanted to use the product. And we required people to actually choose one before starting. Now, this first experiment wasn't a great success. We expected a high drop-off rate, and we actually got one. Uh, but the even, even trickier thing was that there was no winner. The answers were evenly split across all of the options. And this really didn't help us choose a use case you know, to get an investment in or customize around that. We couldn't really make a decision here. One of our hypotheses was that maybe people just want all of those things. So we decided, OK, we'll change our approach, and we will test something else. Maybe we'll show people a set of features that they might want to have. They can even pick multiple. And then we'll figure out which features tend to get bundled together. Except this didn't work either. People wanted most of the features, which, again, did not help us narrow down the options of which things we show people. We did actually find that there were some sort of bundles that tended to go together. The three bundles were around features that make making big announcements to a team easier, features for managing projects and tasks, and features that help teams share ideas and collaborate together. So we thought, OK, we'll run a final experiment, and we'll show people these three buckets of things, and we'll ask them to choose one of those areas. And once they've picked an area, we'll show them a quick 20-second video, like this one that can work even with the sound off. It shows them how to do those specific things they might be wanting to do in the product. Um, they watch it quickly when they land there, and that'll help us. So we built this experiment, and we started it running. Now imagine us taking the time to run all of these different experiments, which, again, are not succeeding. Uh, we're not seeing any metric wins. It's not working out the way that we planned. And the team is starting to get pretty antsy. Um, normally, the team would have stopped uh, running these experiments on the first or second experiment, because we, be, we would have needed to shift focus to things that would be metric wins. Uh, at Facebook, our teams have really big goals, and we need to try and hit them. It can be really hard to make space for big bet projects like this because they're unproven ideas. But our team had something that helped us make time for these riskier big bet projects. It was what we've been called a small experiments day. And it's actually been responsible for half our team metric wins every quarter. Um, it can sound impressive, but it's actually pretty simple. Here's how it works. 
You get everyone to make a big list of the small ideas uh, you want to work on, but never really have the time for anything that's sort of small enough to be built in a day. Uh, we looked for things that were always annoying us or keeping us up at night. And you know, we usually did product and flow walkthroughs. And every time the team gets together and there's these walkthroughs, we actually often come up with a lot of more ideas that we can add on for future small experiment days. Then the designers actually do some bit of prep work. So we know that we want to be ready for this day. So we actually pick some of the ideas that the team really wants to work on and do some of the early design work before we get to the specific day. So when we get there, all the engineers can just pick up early. Then you get snacks, bring lunch, and you get the team together, and we just build as a team. The environment there, it, it sort of becomes like an hackathon. And this is something that has always been very respected at Facebook. It's sort of an historic thing where a lot of our biggest ideas, like the like button, have come from. At the end of the day, people demo the changes they have been built, or even partially built, and we celebrate the progress together. Then engineers set up and run these experiments for these small changes so we can actually measure their success. Finally, we come back in about two weeks later, and we review the results to gather the learnings. It sounds pretty simple, because it is pretty simple. And to show you all how this works, to generate all of these ideas, we're actually going to try doing it together right now. We're going to do a mini activity. Um, so I want you to either like pull out your phone, your laptop, I, I noticed there were notepads floating around. Um, and we're going to take a minute, and I want you to jot down any small ideas for the product that you work on, things that you would like to see fixed or you've always thought like you should do something about. Your only constraint is that it has to be something that a single engineer could build in a day, so it can't be bigger than that. Um, and I'm going to give you a minute to jot this down, and then I'm going to have you share with somebody next to you. So I'll start us a timer. <laughs> okay, that was your one minute timer uh, for jotting down ideas. I noticed some of you are sharing them already. If you haven't started sharing your ideas, please find somebody next to you. I'll give you another two minutes to chat about the things that you came up with. Um, try and explain what the idea is, why you think it's worth building, why is it going to be impactful, what's, what's your hypothesis there. So f grab somebody next to you and share some of your ideas with them. We'll do two minutes on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Works. That's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you guys found that interesting enough to want to keep talking about it. Hopefully, you came up with some interesting ideas, maybe things you actually want to head back and work on with your team. Um, when we do this with our team, we usually generate about 10 to 20 of these small ideas. Um, and we put them in a document, something like this. Anyone can add an idea on our team. That's really important to us. And we keep this list open so that we can keep adding to it whenever we have new ideas. On our team, we ran these small experiment days once a quarter, uh, which was r about the right amount of time to allow us to make the changes, monitor them, come up with new ideas for the next one. So doing these small experiment days is how we kept hitting our team goals whilst making time for those bigger, riskier projects. So if we go back to our big cases uh, use case, uh, we made time for running four major versions of this project, which you know, we're really asking the question, what do you want to do here? And we actually spent about seven months doing that. We could only do that without the sort of like lack of on-the-go measurable success because we were having these days where we could bring all of those metric wins and it, people wouldn't get you know, super anxious about the other time we were spending on this big project. And our final big bet experiment, the one with the three quick videos, saw some surprising results. About half the people who signed up to our product interacted with it. And one of the videos, the one focused on our basic core features, outperformed all of the other videos. It turns out people who watched that particular video were successful. But there was also a control group 
who got no choices and no video, and a chunk of those people were really successful. And when we analyzed all of our experiments together, we realized there was clearly a group of people who did not want any onboarding help, and any time we tried to offer it to them, they became less successful or dropped off. So after all those experiments, we found that our segmentation boiled down to two groups. People who wanted help and really benefited from watching a video in basic product mechanics, and people who didn't want or need any help to get started. Which was honestly a bit disappointing. Uh, looking back, I was maybe hoping to find the silver bullet answer. I had gotten attached to this vision of this beautiful customized onboarding that would show you exactly the thing that you needed, and it was really hard to let go of that. I had moments where I wanted to just give up on this confusing set of experiments altogether. But Marco and I do something slightly differently as design partners. We call on each other when we are exhausted with a project. Sometimes that means we actually switch work for a week. Other times it means just helping to remind each other of our, our long-term goals. So Marco backed me up in meetings. He helped champion the fact that we needed to keep learning from these experiments. And because our team has this sort of culture that is learning from failure is OK, uh, it's more important for us to learn from an experiment than to just ship something. So we go in a room together, and we talk about what our onboarding experience should be, given that we had learned all these things. We agree that we should still offer people onboarding. We show them that 20-second video. But if they opted out of the onboarding at any point, then we shouldn't get in their way. This allowed us to optimize for success for the people that you know, really needed to understand those product me mechanics early on, but also not tank metrics for people who were getting annoyed or frustrated with the barriers that we were putting in their way. Some people want to know how it all works first, while others want to figure out for themselves. You'd be a really annoying host if you tried to explain about everything about your party to everyone, and you'd be a considerate host to you know, show unsure guests the lay of the land. It's really those two types of people. Some guests want help, and others just want to enjoy the party on their own. Learning these lessons was only possible because we run those small experiment days. They give you runway. They create space to work on bigger, more ambiguous problems. And now we ask ourselves a series of questions before we tackle a big bet project. Is the risk and reward high for tackling this problem space? If it's not, this is just a regular project. Are we willing to hold on to these ideas loosely and care about what we'll actually learn here rather than holding on tightly to this beautiful design idea we had at the very beginning? Um, and do we have someone in mind who can be a design ally, someone to help when the going gets tough? Because on these big, risky, ambiguous projects, it will likely at some point. Then when the big bet is actually running, we ask ourselves, are we still prioritizing what people need, even if it goes against our original ideas for this project? How is the atmosphere on the team? Do we need to run a small experiment stay? We ask ourselves if we are continuing to build a culture that rewards learning over shipping things. And ultimately, are we making something that's better than the old experience that we're trying to replace? Because if not, we're just going to be back here in six months' time redoing this work. We'd really encourage you to find ways to take on a big project. You'll learn so much. You need to find your big issues, fix the baseline before optimizing, and make really that time for those big ideas. If you can't solve your core problems, it won't matter how many people come to your party. Everyone will keep sneaking out. We'd really encourage you to try tackling a big bet because it is how you will make big shifts in your product strategy. But at the very least, try a small experiment stay. You'd be surprised at what problems you end up solving. And in case you want to run a small experiment stay of your own, we've pulled together a template that has some ground rules uh, and a place to capture your ideas. If you do try this with your team, we'd love to hear how it goes. Send us feedback. Yeah, we can tweet this later as well. Just make sure everyone has the link. Thanks for listening. Thank you.